Hey guys, this video is on valence bond theory and hybridization theory. So we'll start with valence bond theory and what valence bond theory says. Okay, so what we're trying to explain is how covalent bonds form. How when two uh, non-metal atoms come together, how they form a bond. Um, we know that when the atomic orbitals overlap, um, the potential energy for the two atoms decreases compared to them being far apart from each other. So if we look at the simple hydrogen molecule, you know we've saw, we saw this um, this, this uh, graph before. As they're as they're infinitely far apart, we their relative energies are zero. As they come closer together, the electrons on each atom start feeling the Coulombic effect of the positively charged nucleus on the other atom, and it lowers the overall energy until we reach a minimum. Going past this, then now the two positively charged nuclei start seeing each other and they repel each other, increasing the energy. And the minimum of the energy is the average bond length. Um, so what valence bond theory says is that the, um, an unpaired electron in, one, in an orbital, in a valence orbital, of course, in one atom, overlaps with an unpaired electron in an orbital in another atom to form a covalent bond. Um, for example, um, hydrogen sulfide, H2S. Um, the electron configuration for sulfur is neon 3s2, 3p4. So sulfur has two paired electrons in the 3s orbital, two paired electrons in one of the 3p orbitals, but it has two 3p orbitals, each with one electron in them. And these, in, according to valence bond theory, these orbitals here are uh, available to form a bond with another atom. So each hydrogen atom, its hydrogen's 1s1, has a single electron in a 1s orbital. And so it, what valence bond theory says, if this hydrogen 1s orbital overlaps with one of these sulfur 3p orbitals, the two electrons pair up and we get a, you know, a lower energy species, um, we form a bond. Um, now, the thing about this is we have to remember that the shapes of these orbitals. So remember, an s orbital is a sphere centered on the nucleus. The three p orbitals are all, remember, there are three p orbitals, orbitals for every energy level that has p orbitals. Um, these, these are um, 90 degrees to each other. They're lobes that are centered on the nucleus. Now, they're 90 degrees to each other, so that means that these two 3p orbitals are, you know, they're 90 degrees to each other. So when they form bonds to these hydrogen atoms over here, um, valence bond theory predicts that the bond angle should be about 90 degrees. And it is. It's pretty close to 90 degrees for hydrogen sulfide here. Okay, we're going to come back to this. Remember this example, um, because this is an example of valence bond theory doing a good job. But... Um, when we look at methane, which is CH4, well, we'll look at carbon and hydrogen. Let's just look at, say it that way. Um, carbons and try to perform the same sort of analysis. We see, we know that carbon's electron configuration is helium 2s2, 2p2. So carbon has two unpaired electrons available to form bonds, and hydrogen is 1s. So valence bond theory predicts that carbon should form two bonds to hydrogen, and they should be, again, 90 degrees to each other. Um, we know that doesn't happen. Um, so if we could try to fix this if we t take one of these electrons in the 2s orbital and excite it up, give it a little bit of energy and put it up into one of these 2p orbitals. Well, now carbon has four unpaired electrons, and so now it can form four bonds to hydrogen, which we know it does. However, the geometry does not work out because these 2p orbitals are still 90 degrees to each other, and we know um, that the bond angle in CH4 methane is not 90 degrees. So valence bond theory does not work in this case. Um, so what that means is um, we need a new theory. What we know is about methane, CH4, is that there are the four hydrogen atoms are all um, 109.5 degrees from each other. It's a, tetrahedron, a tetrahedral shape like we learned about in Vesper theory. Um, and p orbitals just will not give us that geometry. So we need a new theory. Thus the birth of hybridization theory. Um, what hybridization theory does is it takes the atomic orbitals, like the s's and the p's and the d's if it has to, and it mixes them together or hybridizes them. Um, 
you know, kind of imagine it. Well, you know, one, you know, analogy, I guess, would be a, a mule, which is um, a hybrid between a, a horse and a, a donkey, if, if you know about those. Um, and that's kind of like what these hybrid orbitals are. Um, now, this mixing together is actually a mathematical operation. What they do is they take the wave functions. Remember from the from Schrodinger's equation, h psi equals e psi, um, and add them and subtract them together, and the results are the hybrid orbitals. But don't worry, okay? we don't have to do the math. We get to look at pictures. So it's going. Um, so what we're doing here is we're describing which orbitals will mix together and which hybrid orbitals are formed, and it ends up that. The, the type of hybrid orbitals that are formed and how many there are depends upon how many electron groups there are on the central, well, on the atom. It doesn't have to be central. So any atom in a molecule that has two electron groups on it, for example, beryllium chloride has two electron groups on it, carbon dioxide has two electron groups on it, and each of these nitrogen has two electron groups. Remember, a lone pair is, is an um, electron group and a bond pair. Now remember, it doesn't matter for electron groups if, if it is a single, double, or triple bond. That still counts as one electron group. So nitrogen, two electron groups, carbon, two electron groups, beryllium, two electron groups. So what happens when, when an atom has two electron groups on it in a molecule? Um, the valence s orbital and one of the valence p orbitals mix together and form two hybrid orbitals called sp because we're a mix of s and p. So this picture is a pretty good description of it. So this would be an s orbital here. This would be a p orbital. When we mix them together, okay, when we add them together, we get one of these, which is an sp orbital. And when we subtract them, we get another, which is a, another sp orbital. And when we, um, and both of these hybrid orbitals are still centered on the same nucleus. So when we put them together on the same nucleus, it looks like this, and they are 180 degrees apart from each other, um, giving us linear geometry about any molecule or excuse me, any atom that is sp hybridized. Okay. In terms of energies, it looks like this. Um, this is for beryllium chloride. So beryllium is um, helium 2s2, so that we don't worry about the 1s. So the, the 2s2 is right here. When we take this s orbital and one of these p's, we mix them together, we get two sp orbitals. Now hybrid orbitals are always between the energy of the lower energy and the higher energy atomic orbitals. So 2p orbitals are up here, 2s is down here. Remember, this is energy on the, the y-axis here. The hybrid orbitals are somewhere in between. Um, and we can, we can take and put these electrons wherever we need them to. We'll, we'll see this a little bit later. But if we take these two electrons, we can put them into one of one, uh, each, in, each into one sp hybrid orbital. And now we have two orbitals, each with one electron in it, available to form a bond to a chlorine atom. Okay. Um, and carbon dioxide and nitrogen do the same thing. So two electron groups, sp hybridized. We call these sp hybrid orbitals. Next, if there are three electron groups on an atom in a molecule, then the, s, the valence s orbital and two of those valence p orbitals mix together and they form three hybrid orbitals called sp2, right? because they're a mix of s and two of the p orbitals. So it might look, you know, look something like this. There's an s, there's two of the p's. Mix them together, we get three sp2 orbitals. When we, and they're all, of course, they're all still centered on the nucleus. So when we put set them on the nucleus, they look like this. Those three orbitals end up being 120 degrees from each other in the plane. We get a trigonal planar geometry. <clears throat> Um, so examples of molecules that have sp2 hybrid hybrid orbitals on, the, on, on an atom in them would be um, borane, BH3, and formaldehyde right here. So this one has one, two, three electron groups on, its, on the atom. So this atom is sp2 hybridized. The carbon has one, two, three electron groups. So it is sp2 hybridized um, in this molecule. Um, so in terms of the energies, again, we take the, the two, you know, this is for um, boron, BH3, 2s2, 2p1 for boron. Take the 2s, two of the 2p's, mix them together, make three equivalent, exactly identical sp2 hybrid orbitals, leaving one 2p orbital unhybridized. 
any two, any p orbitals that are left unhybridized are going to be important to us later on. Um, we can put one of each of these electrons into each of these sp2 hybrid orbitals. So now we have three orbitals, each with a single electron available to form a bond to the hydrogen. And carbon does the same sort of thing here. So three electron groups, sp2 hybridized. Now we, we can talk about hybridization of outer atoms too. This oxygen has one, two, three electron groups, so it's also sp2 hybridized. When an atom has in a molecule has four electron groups, then the valence s orbital and all three of the valence p orbitals mix together to form four what are called sp3 hybrid orbitals. sp3 because there's one part s character, three parts p character. So there's an s, there's three p's mixed together. Notice some of the pictures don't really show it that much, but the more uh, p orbitals there are in a hybrid orbital, the more p character it has, the more it looks like a real or an unhybridized p orbital. But we have, you know, 25% s character, 75% p character here. We get four of these when we center them on the nucleus, which is where they are. Um, they form a tetrahedral geometry, 109.5 degrees. In terms of the energy, so talking about um, methane, carbon. So remember, valence bond theory could not explain the bonding in carbon because experimentally we know that methane, CH4, is a tetrahedral, is, has tetrahedral geometry. The bond angles are all 109.5. Well, if we take the carbon, which is 2s2, 2p2, hybridize all three of these 2p orbitals and this 2s, we make four equivalent sp3 orbitals. Take one of these, take all these electrons, put one in each. Now we have four orbitals, each with a single electron in them that can form a bond to another atom. And we know that these four orbitals are all 109.5 degrees from each other within a tetrahedral geometry. That explains perfectly the, um, the bonding in methane. So that's a really nice success for hybridization theory. Um, now, I'm not going to show the orbitals here because it gets kind of messy and it doesn't, doesn't help anything really. But um, if you have, if an atom has five electron groups in it, on it, in a molecule, then the valence s orbital, all three of the valence p orbitals, and one of the valence d orbitals mix together, and we get five equivalent sp3d orbitals is what they're called. You'll see some textbooks, they'll write the D first. It doesn't matter, D, S, P, 3, S, P, 3, D, same thing. Um, so this, pho the phosphorus and uh, phosphorus pentachloride has one, two, three, four, five electron groups on it. So we would say that the phosphorus is S, P, 3, D hybridized. We can talk about the hybridization of the chlorines too. Each chlorine has one, two, three, four electron groups. So it would be S, P, 3 hybridized. Um, if there are six electron groups on an atom in a molecule, um, then all three of the, I mean, the valence s orbital, all three of the valence p orbitals, and two of the d orbitals mixed together, and we get six equivalent s, what are called sp3d2, sometimes d2, sp3, you see written, same thing, orbitals. Um, for example, in sulfur hexafluoride, um, there are one, two, three, four, five, six electron groups on the sulfur, so we would say it is sp3 D2 hybridized. And the fluorines have four electron groups. We could talk about those being sp3 hybridized. Um, so, a couple of things, guys. First of all, um, if you apply hybridization theory to hydrogen sulfide, okay, remember I was going to bring that back up, H2S, okay, Valence bond theory works really well because we know from experiment that the bond angle in hydrogen sulfide, H2S, is real close to 90 degrees. Well, um, hybridization theory does not give that. It gives a, a way different bond angle, like 109.5, or less than 109.5. So um, we don't use hybridization theory when we're talking about hydrogen sulfide. We choose the one that works. So we would use valence bond theory to talk about hydrogen sulfide, but um, valence, um, hybridization theory to talk about, say, methane. So valence bond theory, when it works, like hydrogen sulfide. Hybridization theory, when it works, like methane. Okay, so this table right here is basically what you need to know about hybridization theory, all in one picture. It tells you how to figure out um, what the hybridization of any atom in any molecule is. 
All you have to do, this, this table calls it electron density, I call it electron groups, same thing. It, this means either a lone pair or a bond. Doesn't matter, single, double, or triple, it's still just one electron group. There's two electron groups, it's, that atom is sp hybridized, and it's those two orbitals are 180 degrees from each other. Three electron groups, sp2, 120 degrees, trigonal planar. Four electron groups, sp3, 109.5, tetrahedral. Five electron groups, trigonal bipyramidal, sp3d, and we get the 90 and the 120 degrees. And six electron groups, sp3d2, octahedral, and we get 90 and 180. Um, so let's do some examples. Um, we want to figure out what the hybridization of the atoms in the following molecules are. So why don't you guys pause the video, see if you can figure it out, and then come on back when you're done. Welcome back. Let's look at some of these. So this first molecule here, this is the Lewis. So I didn't say this explicitly, and I, I need to. Um, in order to figure out the hybridization of an atom and a molecule, you must draw the Lewis structure first. Okay, so that's the, really the first step. Draw the Lewis structure, then count up the number of electron groups on the atom, and that tells you the hybridization theory using this table. So in here, xenon trioxide, um, the xenon, central xenon atom has one, two, three electron groups, so it would be sp2 hybridized. Each of the oxygens has one, two, three electron groups. These would also be sp2 hybridized. In this molecule here, um, the xenon has one, two, three, four, five electron groups, so the xenon would be sp3 dehybridized. The two fluorines have one, two, three, four electron groups, they'd be sp3. The oxygen has one, two, three, it would be sp2 hybridized. Okay, let's look at the other ones. Um, oxygen difluoride. The central oxygen has one, two, three, four electron groups on it, so it would be sp3 hybridized. Likewise, the fluorines each have four electron groups, and they'd also be sp3 hybridized. In krypton tetrafluoride, the central krypton has one, two, three, four, five, six electron groups on it, so it would be sp3d2 hybridized. And the fluorines also now once more have four electron groups, sp3 hybridized for each of these guys. And really, that's all there is to it, guys.